So, uh, Web3 is still so speculative. It's not a purchase, uh, like a consumer purchase market where they're purchasing something, um, you know, like market acceptance is purchase and use. Um, it's still in the investment stage and it's speculative. Um, as opposed to what's happening with most of the mature markets that are happening like with, you know, Web2 and other and other markets where the purchase, uh, you know, like, uh, you know, do people like your product? You can tell because they buy it. Um, what happens a lot more, and I think this is what Moby is getting towards, is what happens a lot more in Web3 is you'll have a successful sale of something, but that doesn't necessarily mean that um, that product is at the end of the day going to be successful. It may still be a failure because um, you don't know whether or not the founders will run off with the money or there's going to be long-term uh, you know, acceptance or whatever. And that, again, is different parts of the industry. So here's, here's part of this, right? Um, and I'm, I'm totally interjecting in your conversation, and I apologize. It's really just the privilege of the fact that it's my space, but I'm totally interjecting. And you guys have extremely valid points because, because James is totally right um, in the real world, right? In the non-Web3 world, that's exactly how it works. We have a weird world in the Web3 world right now, and uh, and it is we're we're moving out of that. I'm 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 am starting to be optimistic, mostly because a down market plus regulation tends to clear out a lot of this sort of hypey speculative stuff. Um, what we had were a lot of products that did work, right? But working alone and solving a problem does is not enough when you aren't regulated, when you're not following the rules, right? You need to know uh, the rules, you need to have a use case, and you need to have a market or customers, right? Um, they were not doing all three. So Binance may have, it does have a use case. It was a fork of Ethereum, right? And it was a cheaper fork of Ethereum, great. But they did not care specifically about the rules. There's lots of, you know, a lots of documentation that they, he was basically a pirate trying to find, you know, the unregulated jurisdiction, you know, or whatever it is, Gar, um, because uh, that's what he wanted. He specifically wanted that. He specifically put in a lot of people as his puppet in order to um, to basically have someone standing in instead of him, uh, you know, governing whatever jurisdiction that was. And um, and and there are pe and people love it. Uh, not because it solves a problem. There are other things that solve the same problem that Binance did. There's still this sort of like, um, you know, anti-institutionalist uh, feel that likes the idea of some renegade getting away with stuff without realizing that the people who get hurt with no regulation are them, right? It's the same idea as um, poor people voting for rich people tax breaks, right? not realizing that giving the rich people tax breaks means less money for them. They say, why don't we have any money? Well, but you voted for rich people tax breaks, and that means there's no money for that program you wanted or for more social security or for whatever it is, right? Because they're not paying into it. But no, but I need that money. But what happens when I'm rich? But you're not gonna be rich. Like, they want you to think that you're gonna be rich so that you might take advantage of this, but that's not what's happening, right? That's not what's happening. So that's a lot of the mentality of what happens is you have a lot of people who are voting against regulation simply because, um, you know, they don't really understand that the beneficiary of a lot of the regulation, not all of it, some of it is stupid, um, but, but the beneficiary of the regulation, generally speaking, is them right? It's not that company, it's them. So um, the other thing about this is that like, for example, with Bored Apes, right? There are a lot of people that see Bored Apes and see just, um, you know, uh, a monkey or, or an ape, um, you know, well, is there are monkeys, right? Um, the Just the monkey on the, on like as a cartoon, but that's not what it was, right? What it was is a partner that was a ringer who was a CAA, the creative arts something or other. Look, they're, they're agents for all the celebrities here in LA, right? And one of them was a partner and that's how they got a bunch of celebrities, yeah, these apes, and got a lot of free publicity for it. And what did they do? What was that really? What really is Bored Apes? 
Bored Apes is a live meetings with people that have a lot of money or celebrity or both, right? Or are OGs who totally know the space, right? Who know all the people to get something done. That's worth a lot of money. That ape is like, a, it's like, a, it's like a, a membership to a, an exclusive golf club, right? That's what that is. And people look at those and like, why aren't they selling or whatever? Why aren't they selling? Because they want the entry into those live events. It, the apes now are ape fest. That's what they go for because they want to meet the people. It is to meet the people. That is what those things are. So don't be fooled by some of these things, right? They aren't failures. What they are is access, right? But the other people who try to follow them didn't understand that. They saw just a monkey, you know, cartoon and thought that's what it was, but they didn't do the building behind it. And so what they came out with was just a cartoon. And that was what they did. And that's all they have. There's the people who are in Bored Apes made a crap ton of money, but it was not from buying and selling Bored Apes. And it was not from the IP, right? It's from the private deals they landed and there were so many of them. So many deals came out of, especially the, uh, the first year of Bored Apes. So many deals, like they just got together. Hey, you could afford, you know, a uh, hundred thousand dollars for this NFT, I'm doing a project. Okay, let me get in on that. Okay, well, let's all do this together. Let's make it happen. And a year later, it comes out. How do you think most of this stuff happened? <laughs> That's how it happened. That's how they made money. What was ApeCoin? Liquidation of some of that value without being able to, without having to sell board the, that ape token, that board ape. That's what they were trying to do. People were like, I'm sitting on something that's so expensive, I can't sell it because then I don't have access to stuff anymore. But I want, I need some of the money from this. What do I do? So they're like, ApeCoin, right? We'll give it to you. You sell it to other people, you know, because it's from you guys. You guys get all the profit from it. It'll be great, right? That's what they did. So there's a lot of very well thought out finances from there. Now, I think they're going to get screwed by ApeCoin. But... Uh, there's a lot of really well thought out finance and economic background in that whole concept. There's a construct behind it. Azuki, no, right? That was also Zagabond, right? Who had screwed people over several times and used anonymity behind it. So we have to look at the underpinnings of these things and really dig in. Was there an economic model behind it? And what people don't understand about a lot of these things and, and what people in, in traditional industry understand so much better than Web3 in Web3, people think the drop of the token is the end. It's the beginning, and it's a long, long haul. What people don't understand, it, like people understand that in the regular world, right? In the normie world, you understand when you're in a startup, you're in it for years, and it's work, and it's a lot of hard work. And it's, I mean, there's just, you just know you're in it. It's a long time. It's years before you get paid. It's a grind. It's a long time, right? There's wonderful parts. There's terrible parts, but you're in it. In Web3, we have this very short-term mentality where, you know, I just grind, 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 grind for like four to six months, and then bam, I drop a token, and then I'm done. No, no. You have to keep going. That's the beginning. Dropping the token if you're an NFT project or you know, you're building something and you drop a token for it, that's the beginning. You have to keep going, right? That is not the end. That is not how business works. You do not end at that point. You keep going. These are indefinite projects. If you don't want an indefinite project, you should not start a company or a project, right? They are by nature indefinite unless or, unless or until you have some exit event. What is an exit event in Web3? you have to either decentralize or hand that sucker off to someone else. We don't even have a structure for that yet. We don't have a structure for that yet. That has to be developed still. Most people are just dumping them. They're like, I'm tired. No, everybody gets tired. Everybody in web two, every, everybody in traditional, everything gets tired. But there is a, a predetermined struct like exit event, acquisition or going public, right? 
we have to think about those here. You know what, you're done with your founding team, like you're done, you get to a certain point, you sell it to another founding team who takes it farther, right? And then you go public. You know, you, we have to think about these things in these longer term, more indefinite things. Okay, um, uh, James, and then David, and then uh, Fighter. That, that, thank you, Alex. Amen, amen, amen. That is, so this is like, I think primarily the point I was trying to drive home to, it doesn't matter what you call it. It doesn't matter whether you, what currency, what things are labels and hype and whatever we're putting on it. The human race and us as a human race and how things work does not, the core fundamentals, we are who we are at the place we are at. And when you're, you're saying, oh, well, it's part of the future, all startups are part of the future. Just because you call yourself Web3 doesn't give you an excuse to not build long term, to not abide with, to not run your company with ethics, to not plan to have a life for your customers and not just drop them like hot potatoes when you get tired, as Alex was just saying, screwing a lot of people. This is why Web3 gets a bad name. There's a lot of great technology that can be built with Web3 that have real world applica applications that can help everybody else evolve into wherever we are going, whatever the market will demand. And the mar when the market demand, my point was when the market demands it, when the market keeps using it after they demand it, when they keep spending money with it, says, hey, a founder, finally built a company utilizing web three that was great and it was had great fit and it solved a problem well it was desired by people they wanted in their lives i think that was all i was trying to drive home here and i feel like the number one of the biggest problems with web three is i keep hearing this word project what i'm sorry wtf what the hell is that project is something that you do in your spare time for homework not something you make billions of dollars off of and then run away, run, take the money and run away and screw over as many people as you can. That's what people are doing with it. Sorry, that's like the fundamentally in the name is something short term to be used by con artists and thieves and criminals to screw people over. If you're not one of those people, don't use that terminology. Build a great product and realize that there's a 99.9% .9 chance you're going to fail at it and but don't go and try to get tons of people's money without having at least a plan to hopefully give them something back for it anyway that's my thoughts all right you don't get to call project of, you know come on man it's the <laughs> no, no, lingo of a different term. part of the it's industry the come on man <laughs> in the that's... definition the short term <laughs> that's all i mean clubhouse yeah, is, James, James clubhouse is... is still calling itself a startup come on now <laughs> James is a boomer. James is a boomer, though. So that's why he's the, life, the modern life. We love you anyway, on, man. Bro. Okay, love you guys too. On, I get a, I get a run too. No, come on, we were Tech kidding. Crunch. No, no, I, I have a Bloomberg event at Tuck Crunch here. I've, uh, I've got to be out in like 15 minutes. So, no, but I love y'all, Marco. We need, we need to play golf again. Get out there. Like, been too long. Yeah, we'll take, we'll take our uh, board eight. Yeah into our exclusive course. <laughs> <laughs> I want there to be a golf course called Board Ape. Something Alex, like you that. Know, you know me and Marco have hung out in real life. I know now. I know now you guys have. So, yay. You guys, like, everybody cool is hanging out from, from that group and, like, not me. So, do 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 Not feeling like a loser at all. Nope, 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 nope. Not me. So, <laughs> you guys should come down to L.A. <laughs> Hang out with me. I'm fun. I promise. You're, you're not coming to my party like this week in San Francisco. What? I can't. I have kids. I have little kids. Bring them. Bring I them. have Go. little kids. <laughs> I can't love. bring my kids. Sure. I can. You want me to drag my kids? Yeah. Bring them, honestly. Okay, my. Kids... my... Take, take the kids. Take the kids with all James's kids. So uh, they'll have a riot. But also, um, James, I think Alex is not sharing with you the real reason why she's not going. 
Uh, she's already highlighted in the space that she's a snob. And as we well know, snobs don't mix with minions <laughs> like you and I. <laughs> That's right. That's right, James. It's really, it's really because you're a peon. No, it's <laughs> my, my my original 1920s TPZ with like 30 year old McKellen's not good enough for my hugs, Alex. That's awesome. That's awesome. I actually went and, to a party that was the seller. <laughs> I went to a party that was thrown by McKellen and, uh, and it's, I mean, that stuff is nice. And I'm such a, like, I'm, I'm like, so junior at like, uh, you know, what it's whiskey, right? Like sipping or whatever. I was like, this is great. And, you know, it was like eight year old and they handed me the, like the 12 year old. I was like, ah, it burns and burns and burns. <laughs> and then they were like, there's a 21 year old. And I was like, I can't, I don't think it will kill me. But, um, but yeah, so I will tell you that my youngest likes to be naked a lot. <laughs> That's you fine. sure you want that at your party? We're, we're, in, the hippie, we're in the hippie San Francisco. Uh, Is that the kind of party Alex, you have? Quit trying, to quit trying to monetize. No! Who said that? No, no, no. <laughs> we, we, oh we feel like everybody and their kids. <laughs> Uh, that's really awesome. I will actually ask. That's really great. Um, so I was just like, no, it's going to be hard with, you know, to leave the kids. Uh, but, uh, but yeah, sure. I'll ask. Um, that'd be cool. Um, no, we got a big enough house and yeah, come on, come on over. Uh, you're so awesome. Um, but definitely. Okay. So Thursday we're talking finance. It's going to be awesome. 10 o'clock, uh, Pacific, uh, we do this every Tuesday at 10 a.m. Pacific for founders. And then every uh, Thursday, 10 a.m. Pacific, we're talking about finance. And uh, we talk about all sorts of things, stocks, bonds, uh, crypto, market signals, all that other stuff. Um, the link for this week is, uh, is in the top. Uh, you can download the quick pitch link. Also, um, it's a free pitch guide, talks about all the psychology and all sorts of stuff of why this quick pitch thing works. Uh, I am that kind of person. I research the hell out of everything. I'm the person where if you like, like we have a trampoline and uh, anybody who wants a trampoline, like will call me, like, how did you, what'd you get? How do you know? Like, what should I get? Here's my yard. Like, what should I get? So uh, I'm that person. I research like any part. I'm like the consumer guide uh, upgrade. So <laughs> I will, I research the hell out of everything. And, um, uh, so uh, when I did this quick pitch, I was like, okay, I got, it has to work because I'm super awkward and an introvert. So um, I wanted to make sure that I had some method of starting relationships with people that I don't know uh, that wasn't going to be um, really difficult, that, was, that left it open enough but wasn't something that was oppressive or uh, basically overwhelming. You don't actually want to pitch people. What you are is just talking a little bit about what you do enough of enough to invite them into further discussion. If they're so inclined, that's really it, right? It's just the answer to, so what do you do or why are you here? If you're looking for investors, if you're looking for collaborators, if you're looking for co-founders, um, co you can adapt it to any of that. That's what it's for, right? That's what it's for. It is for easy adaptation. It is a way to introduce yourself for the sole purpose of getting another meeting. You are not there to get money. You don't even know if that's somebody you want to invest in your company or you want to work with. You don't even know. You're just there to get the next meeting. You want their information and you want to set up another meeting, something easy. Let's get coffee. You know, can I come to your office? Let's continue talking. I'd like to ask you about whatever, right? That's all you're trying to do. The, the, the ask at the end of this is the same for everyone, which is let's get to the next meeting. Because remember, it's about familiarity. It's not about, uh, you know, pounding into them that you're awesome and give me money. Nobody wants to feel like a wallet and nobody is that awesome. Zero people are. So, um, you know, you just, you're just trying to get them to feel comfortable with you. And if it's something that they're interested in, then great. Then you'll know, right? They'll ask you questions. The idea is to make them ask you questions because then they're invested in your conversation. They will be listening for the answers. They will, they will have to because they asked them. They're now personally invested in those answers. And 
Um, and then you'll be able to tell whether or not they're actually interested in continuing the conversation or not. If they're not, no harm, no foul. Okay, great. Well, it was great meeting you and you move on. They may know other people who are very invest interested in, in talking to you. If you are not overwhelming, then it's awesome because they will actually want to introduce you. If you are overwhelming them, they will not do that to their friends, right? You don't want to do that to your friends. Yeah, I know somebody who'd be super interested in you, but I'm not going to introduce you because you're awful. <laughs> you don't want to do that. You want to be the person that someone else it gets a lot of credit for because you introduced that per like they introduced you. You want to be that person. So this is just about making introductions. So that's, you can get a free download and it explains all of that. Um, and go to my site, sign up for my newsletter. That's explaining the news, right? Taking news items and understanding how you can get financial advantage from news. That's where real power is, right? It's not a secret. There's not secrets, right? The secrets are usually illegal. If someone is trading in secrets, it's usually not a legal thing that they're doing. Legal money, big legal money, Michael Burry money, uh, um, you know, um, what's his name? Why is his name calling? I'm not drinking enough coffee anymore. Um, I'm trying to cut down. It's not working for me. Um, what's his name? Oh, my God. I can't believe I just felt his name fell out. The huge uh, hedge fund manager that I talk about all the time. Anyway. Uh, <laughs> Mark Andreessen. No, no, no. Uh, uh, what's his name? Ray Dalio. Thank you, Ray Dalio. Ray Dalio. Loyal list, long time listener. Thank you, Ray listener. Dalio. Ray Dalio, who's doing a master class, by the way, and I'm gonna I'm gonna watch because I think that's awesome. Ray Dalio. Uh, so Ray Dalio, um, also like this is what he does. He understands the news. You know who else does? Warren Buffett and Charlie Munger. Uh, they understand the news better than other people. They're reading public documents. They're not reading secret things. They're reading public documents and they just understand it better than other people do, right? They understand the implications of that news. It's not just reading the news and understanding the words because they're English. It's saying, okay, I understand this news like I was just talking about earlier with Ozempic. Okay, Ozempic is eating the market, which I still think is funny as hell. Ozempic's eating the market. What does that mean? What can I get from that information? What do I know? And that was two newsletters ago, right? That's what we talked about. We talked about what does that mean? Let's break down the implications of that. What do we know? Some of that stuff we can find out. And I showed you how to find that out. Who do you, what can you invest in based on that knowledge? What do you short? What do you long, right? What do you go long? What do you invest in? What do you want? What do you take long term because of that knowledge? What do you, what do you short? What do you know is going to drop because of that knowledge? And I broke that down. That's the kind of information that's useful, right? Because people will read Ozempic and just be focused on Ozempic, but there's more there. There's more there. That knowledge is, is like, any fact has to be put into a larger pool of information. You're, you're going to start taking facts and applying them to this larger pool of information. So facts aren't useful independently. That's how most people operate. Independent fact. Can I use this? Can I not use it? Throw it away. Facts have to be incorporated into the larger picture. What do I know about the industry as a result of this? What do I know about the economy as a result of this? What do I know about buying habits as a result of this? What implications happen as a result of this? And that may sound like I don't even know how I would even do that, but you'll learn. You'll learn. And that's about knowing how money moves through systems and understanding the psychology of people in mass, right? The psychology of an individual no idea. I am not a psychologist. Individuals can be crazy as hell. People in groups are super predictable. Super predictable. And that knowledge is extremely powerful for anything blockchain, anything in a company, and anything economic. 
that's incredibly powerful in, um, information. I am always shocked at how people just bypass information about psychology when truthfully, that is a superpower, right? That's where the really powerful information and knowledge comes from. Go ahead, Marco. Yeah, I was just gonna chime in on the information piece. So I'm not Warren Buffett or Ray Dalio, but uh, I am a keen, keen reader. Okay, I, I, I will Buffett. accept you, even though you are not Warren Buffett or Ray Dalio, you. you may speak. Thank you, thank you, <laughs> thank you, thank you. As a minion, I appreciate you. Um, and, you know, I, I term it as looking at the micro and the macro. That, you know, as a, as a founder, as a startup, you should always, always be reading what's going on not in your market, but outside of the market. And I'm going to give an example to your point that you just made, Alex. So last week I was um, at a conference. I was on a VC panel and there were about 250 people in the audience. The conference was around AI and blockchain typically, a three-day conference. In this particular panel session, I asked the question of the audience. Uh, it was here in the UK. And the question was, who in the audience has read the UK's um, science and technology framework and i am not kidding you only two people put their hand up and this is why it was so important I'm stressing this point about reading that the science and technology framework is the only published framework from a g7 country in the world uk is the only one to publicly put out what their framework and their goals and their vision is from science and technology in the next five years on top of that, the key, and there are 10 points, 10 key points in that document. Um, and it doesn't, you know, it's, it's about a 30, 35 minute read. Um, you know, I'm a, I know some people that uh, might uh, be too long, but hey ho, it is what it is. Because the, the main nugget in it is that the UK government a year spends 500 billion pounds. What's that, about $750 billion? A year uh, on public spending that means there is 750 billion dollars available for companies to go and gain from contracts with the UK government there is also a bill going through the UK Parliament at the moment that of that 750 billion dollars uh, something like 10 15 percent will be allocated to SMEs so it won't be all about big companies gaining these country, uh, contracts, it will be SMEs. If I was a startup or a founder in the space, in, that, in, in science and technology, I'd be all over that document and be all over making the connections that I need to make to be able to tap into a percentage of that $750 billion. So I just wanted to give a real life example to what you were saying. You have to read all the information you can not reading is is not a thing. Agree. And SMEs are small, medium enterprise. So uh, smaller companies, not these multinational companies. So um, it's really important to, to get into that um, and start learning as much as you can and knowing who's valuing the kind of company that you have. That's really important. Because if you're if you're a, like if you're a science and technology company and you're a smaller company, it sounds like the UK is the place to go, right? Like look where people want you. Don't go to dry ground where people are like, I, you know, look, we're full up, <laughs> or or like that's not something that we specialize in. There are a lot of people that farm ground that's not fertile for them, right? If you're in biotech, go where biotech is wanted, right? Go to Cleveland, the Northeast Corridor, right? Don't spend your time in an area where nobody is dealing with biotech because they don't understand what your numbers mean. They don't understand your growth. They're not ready to invest. They don't understand your time frame. They're going to be like, God, you have what, how much testing still to do? Like they don't see that. They don't understand your your industry and your time frames, right? So go where there's fertile ground, um, which means you always need to be researching where the fertile ground is. Things actually shift. So... Um, it used to not do that, but I find that things have been shifting um, as more remote work happens. Uh, it looks like, and maybe other people are finding different things, but it looks to me like uh, some of these, at least the angel networks and some of the VC networks 
are shifting a little bit because they're not tied to the areas that they were. Like they still uh, go to those areas and go to meetings and things like that. But it looks like um, they're kind of spreading a little bit more because um, they're going to other areas where it's like more comfortable to be. You know, it's like I, I call it like like my second home, like where like all these VCs and angels are like moving to what their second home is. <laughs> they're like, this is nicer than where I used to live. Like, it's just easier or whatever. So there are these secondary communities like Jackson Hole kind of thing, right? Like there's a the community there that was very secondary um, has become more of a primary community for some things. You know, Austin's a primary community for some things. That's not really just oil and gas, right? So it's Th these communities have been emerging and moving in different areas, um, you know, and remote work really kind of shifted things a lot. So um, it's been interesting. I don't know if you guys have noticed anything different like that, but. Well, I live in Austin for 25 years, so I, I can tell you guys the story of barbecue and <laughs> tacos and Whole Foods and Dell and uh, Apple's second largest campus for uh, like 17 of those years. I mean, Austin's growing enormously. Uh, it's it's just becoming this uh, a major hub of like there's a ton of blockchain in Texas, and um, and it's becoming like a tech hub out in in Austin. A lot of people from Southern California energy prices. Yeah, well, I mean, yeah, that's, that's, when they're good, they're some of the big the biggest crypto mining community. Uh, yeah. Well, when they're good, they're great. When they're bad, they suck, right? Because there's no middleman in Texas, right? They don't, they, they, they basically everybody wholesales. Uh, they don't have a middleman smoothing out the prices that most uh, states have. So when they're good, the prices are great. But, uh, but when there's a price increase, like when there's a spike or something, then uh, nobody can handle it because it's, it's nothing smoothed out. <clears throat> so, um, so anyway, it's, that's a whole other issue there, but uh, there's a very interesting, uh, but with Austin, there's very interesting new dynamic because uh, the nature of the communities, I understand, are changing a lot. A lot of people from Southern California have been moving uh, to Idaho, which is very interesting because that's a super conservative stronghold. Um, and also to Austin, formerly, well, no, that was, it was like a liberal blob in the middle of a very conservative area. And, um, and I understand it's changing the community a lot, too. And um, we tripled in population in 20 years. It's it's obscene. It's so it's not growing. It's grown. Um, and and like I've been playing beach volleyball for a long time. And now I see six on six uh, groups of, of uh, South Asians playing volleyball. I mean, there's cricket at, at, at parks that used to just have soccer fields. So um, there's a shit ton more developers here. Um, and, and it's, it's just a lot of growth and, and a lot of um, price increases already. And it's cooling off because people don't see the value anymore. So it was a, I think it was like a ratchet. A bunch of people over the last three years did come here um, or, or swapped out. And some people moved to Dallas because they want to, you know, Amazon, AWS is bigger there and so forth. But we still have a shit ton of uh, technology. They, call it, they used to refer to us as Silicon Hills because we have the hill country. But um, if anyone comes to town, uh, send me a DM and I'll come meet you for coffee if that's not too intimidating. Right, Alex? Make it inviting. Make it inviting. He's not too scary. Bring a bat. No, no, I don't <laughs> have anything to tell you. I'm not trying to. <laughs> we, anyway, we've known each other for, we're going on more than two years now. Huh? Yeah, no, I, uh, and I. I appreciate you and all that you do. Um, thank you. And I, uh, I have several clients in Austin. Uh, I've never been, but I, um, I understand that it's, um, you know, it's wonderful. I've been invited several times. I should go. Um, and I've been through it. Right. I haven't really visited it. I've been through it. Um, and uh, so I haven't, I can't really say like, you know, I've sort of been there, but that, that's not really the same thing as really like, you know, being there and like, you know, enjoying time there. So uh, I should actually visit for like the next conference that's out there. So um, but anyway, and I'll and I'll let you know when I'm out there, um, you know, South by Southwest is there. Uh, there's so much stuff that happens there. Consensus is usually out there, I think. And uh, so there there's just a ton of stuff that happens out there. Um, if you are interested in. Yeah, I, I met Nicholas at Consensus. Uh, not. I guess a year ago, something around that. 
Oh, okay, cool. Um, so if you are um, interested, so there's, there's some links up at the top. Um, just remember that we, um, we talk to, uh, sorry, we do this every uh, Tuesday at 10 a.m. Pacific. We're talking about anything you've got, founder issues, founder discussion, uh, pitching. If you guys want to practice your pitch, talk about uh, any issues that you have. Um, you know, either finding investors, with investors, co-founders, whatever, all of that stuff, um, you know, uh, you are welcome to um, to uh, come every Tuesday, 10 a.m. Pacific. Every Thursday, 10 a.m. Pacific, we're doing um, finance, personal finance, stocks, bonds, crypto, uh, market signals, all of that stuff. We're doing that breakdown. Questions, bring your questions, all of that stuff. Bring it on Thursday. Um, if you have anything that you want to pitch or talk about, raise your hand. Come on up. Talk about whatever company that you have. Um, there's wonderful people up on stage. You've got investors. And in the audience, you've got investors. We've got um, advisors. We've got all sorts of people around here. Um, so you're all more than welcome to come and talk. If you are not ready, um, you don't have any questions, um, that's totally fine. We've got tons of topics that we can always talk about. Um, but we've gone through quite a lot today in terms of um, you know what you need to do um, in developing your problem, your solution, and using the technology. Go ahead, Dre. Good to see you, by the way. I can't hear you. Is it me? Can anybody else hear Dre? No, I can't. I can't Dre, can you drop down and come right back up? And, and hopefully that'll help your connection. That's so annoying. This has been a big problem today, um, but hopefully we'll fix it really quickly. But I know a lot of people have had some issues with this connection thing. So go ahead, James. It's probably because I'm messaging him on the other line or like, like he's on the way to my house. <laughs> <laughs> he's on the way to your house. Do you guys have a play date? <laughs> I cried <the> play date. <laughs> Just share your toys. Be nice. I imagine you have a lot of toys, actually. You are like the latest tech of everything. That's just kind of my, in my head, you have uh, like a lot of very cool gadgets in your house. Surprisingly, my house is actually mostly antique. <laughs> really? Wow. Well, not I, I, I'm that. an old soul. Everything's old. That's awesome. I, I, do, I, do, have, I do have new tech, too. Yeah, but your house is not better than Alexandra's house because you don't have a trampoline. So I'm just saying. Oh, I got a trampoline. Well, it's not for me, man. We were discussing this the other day. We're like, should we take out these bushes in the corner and put a trampoline in? The kids love it. You know what I would do um, if I could do it again is uh, bury the trampoline. That is actually a very cool thing to do and uh, less risk. Also, um, the issue with the um like the net getting in the trees like we have a lot of fruit trees in our backyard and um and then like the net <laughs> so we get like the kids like hurling uh oranges and lemons out or not lemons uh um what is it there it's oranges and some other fruit like pomegranates out the um out the trampoline whenever they're ripe like they just keep falling in yeah. and and I we're love- like I'm like, not when the dog is in the yard. Like, come on, guys, what are you doing? But that's, I mean, I would do it lower just so you don't have, like, you can pull it away from from stuff and it's it's not as hot and it's also safer. And it's also really cool to have a buried um, trampoline. It's like your ground is super bouncy suddenly. It's super fun. I don't know. In my head, that's really cool. The only problem with it is that you can't put a sprinkler underneath it in the summer. But you're in San Francisco, so you don't get summer. So that's okay. Hey, Magellan, what's up? Hi, good morning. Um, um, I just had a question. I'm going to be applying for a job soon in the field. And since we have, um, like, founders and investors on the panel, I was wondering um, what do you guys look for in an employee? And, and just I'll just say the jobs just so that way, um, you know, to give it a context. They have um, social media, like, engagement kind of um, – um, a job available that there's actually another one too i think i forgot i forgot it but i'm i was i wasn't expecting to speak about it right now um i just wanted to get um spark up some discussion and see if anyone was um had any insight to that 
So I would recommend going to um, spaces that are uh, run by recruiters because they're really good at telling you that kind of stuff, like what kind of things you need to do and uh, what what skills you need to put forward and stuff like that. Um, because uh, that's not something that I personally am like, um, you know, what I look for is very specific to me. Um, and uh, like for, for, for now, for everybody who knows my problems with uh, with built, getting my website done, which is done yet. I mean, it's not, the back end is still being done. We're still putting stuff in and I'll start announcing all that stuff, but yay, I have a website now. Um, but uh, for people who know how hard it was to get alexdanscrew.com do, uh, done, um, I like what I look for is like people who actually do what they say they're going to do, um, so, <laughs> which is apparently a skill that is rare. But do, I, I mean, does anybody here want to want to mention that or is that just better for like a, a recruiter uh, led led space? I don't know if you guys have any thoughts on that. I mean, I'm I'm just going to say probably like a like I don't think people here are the people who, who deal with hiring for the most part. Oh, OK, yeah, that's fine. Um... Well, I appreciate it anyway. I'm still going to uh, be around. Um, yeah, I deal with uh, like NFTs and things like that. But I used to be in DeFi. I see a lot of people are, are really here um, geared more towards DeFi. Not in this space, but I'm saying like normally in general in the Web3 um, uh, crypto Twitter space. So I needed to probably get back on that. I really took a, a, some time away from it to um, get more involved with NFTs. And um, when DAOs came out, I was, you know, kind of seeing what those were about. Um, and I know that's more geared towards like a founder type thing. I haven't found a DAO. I don't, um, and I don't diss anybody that does. I think they're, they are useful. Um, and I think some will be here for the most part. Um, and that's everything. Yeah, I would just say, um, and this is the way I have always done it when I wanted to, to learn something or, or do something like, um, if you want to be part of a team, uh, like, a, you know, like a team that's building a DeFi app or whatever, just get involved in their community. Just go dive in, get in their Discord, um, be super active. And then as they expand, they're going to look at you. That is, as far as I know, oh, that's oh, yeah. how that's how all that yeah. seems to work. So, yeah, I really I really use DeFi as more of like as a retail investor. Uh, I've never seen it. I've seen a lot of I've seen from the sidelines what a lot of founders do. Um, I've like I said, I listen to a lot of developers. Uh